Hi everyone, how y'all doing today? So great to see everybody. Um, I have my little speech. Uh, good morning. And on behalf of New Orleans Center for the Gulf South, we would like to invite you to Women and Movement Number Six, a series celebr. Thank you, thank you. Let's let's do some snaps for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to this. Um, it's a series celebrating and honoring African-descended women in the Gulf South, their strategies for social activism in community, environment, and culture. And thank you all for coming to African-American Women Affecting the Arts in New Orleans, part two. Yes. Uh, so my name is Denise Frazier, and I would like to thank the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South, um, our staff, Executive Secretary Regina Cairns, Okay. That's uh, <laughs> great, just great. You might want to shut. The, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Proctor. <laughs> Executive Director <laughs> Rebecca Sinetiker, <laughs> Student Assistants uh, Layla Larue and Theo Simmons. Thank you to doc Dr. John Ray Proctor, the Theater and Dance Department, the Newcomb Institute Ska and Art and Music Fund, NOLA for Women, and Jarrell Hamilton, who did the research for um, the initial research for the Women and Movement series. Um, it is now my honor to introduce um, two representatives from the office of Mayor Latoya Cantrell. We have Ms. Lisa Alexis, who is the Director of Arts and Culture from the Mayor's Office of Cultural and Economy. And we also have Alana Harris, Deputy of Arts and Culture. And thank you all for coming. And I'm gonna turn it over to the Office of the Mayor. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here on behalf of Mayor Latoya Cantrell. I'm Lisa Alexis. And it is just a pleasure to let you know that the cultural aspect and environment here with the impact that we as women have in this opportunity for the city is, is um, very warming to me this morning. When I think of the fact that uh, females, we have a nurturing aspect within us and we have a nurturing aspect in our city in our culture in our nurturing of our families and also within our art and so whenever i am working with females in this space and working with anyone from the art aspect there is an experience and a feeling that i grow each time i work and i want the ladies to know here on this panel that it is just a complete honor for me to just be chosen in this position and to have an opportunity hopefully to work with each of you i've had the pleasure to work with asali i am going to have a wonderful pleasure to work with gia i have a fellow ron eagle here and <laughs> Ladies, I've read up and I understand the potential and all of the awesome things that you're doing. I want you all to know, before I get too long-winded, which I'm known for, that the Office of Cultural Economy is three major aspects. One, to create opportunities. We stand here not to provide programming, but create the opportunities for the programming that you ladies provide so that it is shared with everyone to experience and enjoy. From there, it will stimulate the economy by bringing income, revenue, and opportunities into the households of our artists and artisans, and then finally to preserve the traditions that we have here and cherish here in New Orleans. Without further ado, I would like to welcome and also introduce our Deputy of Arts and Culture, Elena Harris, who has been well-traveled over this past year and who brings a great wisdom into our office. Thank you. Congratulations, ladies. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all, and I admire each and every one of you. I don't really have a whole lot to say, but I want to say something to the young girls up front. I want to say to you, um, we are a movement by ourselves, but a force when we're together. Mm -hmm. We are a movement by ourselves and a force when we're together. So I am proud and happy to be here in the alignment of all this feminine energy here in the city of New Orleans. You know, all power to the city of New Orleans because New Orleans is female. And if there's anything that we can do 
at the City of New Orleans, particularly in the arts and cultural realm. Please reach out. I know some people we haven't reached out to just yet, but you're on the agenda. Um, and forgive us for the cyber attack. We're working on that too. But um, it's an honor to be here, and I'm looking forward to hearing what these forces have to say today. Thank you. Good morning and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dr. John Ray Proctor. I am an assistant professor of theater and dance uh, here at Tulane University. And my job is to introduce you to the moderator for the morning, Ms. Lauren Turner. Ms. Lauren Turner is a director, a performer, and a producer, and a community facilitator. She is driven by her interest in equitable, place-based, culturally relevant theater, especially as it pertains to the global youth. Her work lives where storytelling, community building, and politics, politics intersect. Lauren is an art equity trained equity diversity and inclusion facilitator. She is a round four recipient in the Leadership U one-on-one -on -one grant program funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and administered by Theater Communications Group designed to further develop prominent emerging leaders and change agents in the American theater. Lauren has also served as a Mellon Fellow through Tulane University's community-engaged community uh, graduate programs, mentoring Tulane University graduate students who wish to implement community-engaged practices into their work. Lauren received her Master's of Fine Arts degree in performance from the University of Southern Mississippi and her Bachelor of Arts degree from North Carolina Central University. She's also the Executive Director for the No Dream Diverd Theater Company. <laughs> When not devising, directing, or producing, Lauren is the ringmaster of her very own home circus that she shares with her partner, Jason, and her three children, Austin, who is eight, Elijah, who is four, and Nia, who is four. Without further ado, African-American women affecting the arts in New Orleans. Hello, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, all right, great. Good morning and welcome. And I just want to take a moment to just um, acknowledge just the joy right now in this room. And can we just give another round of applause for this space? There's so, I don't know. I'm very excited around the potential for this conversation. I'm glad that everyone's schedule permitted them to be here. I'm glad you all schedule permitted you to be here. Um, you know, when you send in your, um, when you send in your bio, you, you don't think that it will be read verbatim. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, I want to thank um, the New Orleans uh, Center for, of the Gulf South. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ray Proctor. I want to thank Tulane University um, and the representatives from the City of American Trails office for being here. And most importantly, for our panelists and for you all, to you all for all being here. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. So um, I'll go this way. <laughs> um, so as executive director of, um, of Ashe Cultural Arts Chief Center. Chief executive officer. Chief executive officer, yes, of, um, of um, Ashe Cultural Arts Center. We have Asali, uh, and you have to always coach me through this. Devon. I know that part, Devon. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, I always wanna say, I don't know what I wanna say, but Ecclesiastes, so please give it up for her. We have executive director and chief curator of the New Orleans African American Museum for History, Culture, and Art History and Culture, uh, Gia Hamilton. Uh, we have the artistic executive director for Junebug Productions, um, and this is Stephanie McKee. And then artistic director of KM Dance Project, we have Keisha McKee. So I always ask this question first, and we can kind of go in whatever order feels natural. Oh, by the way, this is just a very, we're having a conversation. I just want everybody to know. It's not very formal, and we will open it up to questions. But the first question that I have for all of you um, is, 
for you to self-describe your work. I always find it really interesting when you have the public's perception of what you do and then um, as it compares to your own perception of what your work is, which can be also different from your job or your role or your title. So however you would self-describe your work or your aesthetic. Okay. <laughs> well, I am only 38 days in. Give it up for 38 days. <laughs> So I am still in the process of discovering my work. Um, however, I can define it up to this point um, as being, um, I would say, 60% administration, you know, making paper move where it needs to move in order for things to happen. Um, maybe about 25%, and let me keep track of these numbers so I make them add up in the end. <laughs> um, about 25% um, motivation, right, of um, motivating both um, staff and supporters and, you know, funders in, you know, making sure that, um, you know, there are lines and that um, they are moving in the places that they need to be moving in order for things to happen. And then about, I would say 15%, but this is the most important part, 15% um, visioning, right? Um, of, of figuring out what the path is and pulling together, you know, all of the people and the things that um, increase your vision and make it possible for that administration and motivation and operational work to actually happen. And so the great part of my work though is that those things get to happen surrounded by art. Mm -hmm. You're right, and surrounded by culture and propelled by those things. So, you know, while there are many people who administrate and motivate and, you know, all of those kind of what we think of as tedious things, to be able to do them inside of um, our cultural work, you know, provides an impetus for a vision that, you know, is really beyond measure. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I have lots of pithy responses uh, that I give that are kind of sassy, and the first one is that I say I'm a shape shifter for liberation, yeah. right? So um, at, at the helm, I'm interested in doing whatever work is necessary for the liberation of myself, my family, my people, right, and human beings in general. Um, and that means being a disruptor of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find myself kind of weaving in and out of institutional work as I try to understand disrupting a system that um, has to be recreated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's complicated work. I have a practice uh, that's rooted in healing work. It's intersectional. It's rooted in an art making practice that is sort of known as social design. Mm -hmm. um, and it's rooted in um, work that centers around food and land development and cultural practice. Um, and so um, I really appreciate being asked that question because when you sit in a position of leadership um, at an institution, right? Because leadership happens in lots of different ways, but specifically uh, when you're doing institutional work, you can oftentimes be uh, sort of diminished into an administrative role, and that's mm -hmm. how people approach you, and that's how people see you. Um, and so I encourage us, as we have these opportunities to talk both on stage and off stage, to just remember to ground your interaction, um, in particular with these black women in mm -hmm. our humanness, mm -hmm. in our multitude of ways that we get to show up um, on the planet. And then finally I'll say, and I, I like to say this a lot, is I'm a mother and becoming a mother intentionally has informed every leadership decision mm -hmm. that I make. And so I say that unapologetically, my children are infused into my work and um, you know, I have been a sort of beacon and, and really been a steward of saying children and mothers belong in these conversations unapologetically. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's the title, which is executive artistic director, and then there are the things that really happen. Mm -hmm. um, emotions monitor, um, I am, <laughs> and when you're in an organization that's as small as Junebug, um, really the title 
doesn't really mean a whole lot. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, if you gotta take out the trash, you're taking out the trash. There's a lot of things that need to happen. So we are everything um, in the office and all of the things that we do are interconnected. The programming is interconnected and I see myself as the person who connects the dots and that makes the connection make sense, not only to us internally, but that it is something I often describe as the, what is the song that people are singing right now? Uh, what is the song that community is singing right now? And looking at a way that we create programming um, that looks um, and supports the song that people are singing. I think also there's a responsibility to the work that we both produce um, in-house, but also that we present. There's a responsibility um, that I, I feel very deeply um, that is about making sure that we see all aspects of black lives, mm -hmm. not just the, um, the, the hardship, but also joy and the beauty, um, that that is just as much a part of us and it's very important for us to see those things um, in the artistic work. So they're full reflections of ourselves mm -hmm. because we are not monolithic. Mm -hmm. Um, so the full reflection of black lives and black experience um, and supporting black artists in particular. And I say that I'm an artist myself um, and I was really, um, I told this story just recently about how Junebug as an institution really supported me and there are a number of other institutions. I mentioned Junebug only because in, never in a million years did I expect that I would be sitting in this position running Junebug, uh, but there are many people and institutions that are responsible for me being here right now. Um, but one of the things that that did to me was um, infused in me this, I, the, the deep responsibility of paying it forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like a lot of the work that I do is advocacy work um, for the artist. Um, I think a lot of the work is about changing and shifting narratives about what it means um, to be in the South and doing work. Um, a lot of the work is also advocacy on behalf of black women in particular in leadership because it's hard and I've seen a lot of people that are in these positions crash and burn. You know, so there's the beauty that we sit and we talk about but we oftentimes don't talk about the labor the invisible labor that's there that sets you up to be able to navigate the world. So there was a lot of invisible labor that happened here. So I like to make that labor visible mm -hmm. so that people understand um, the shoulders um, that we stand on. Um, I am a performing artist. Uh, I'm an educator. I'm a choreographer. Um, a lot of the work um, that I have done has been with youth. Um, and as the artistic director of KM Dance Project, um, I have been able to create a space or hold a space for not only myself, but other young aspiring choreographers to be able to have a platform um, to create work and to, um, you know, and put that on a performance stage and, and have a, a family of other supporting artists where we can support each other in that art and creative making process. Um, the work that I do with youth, I, I, I've been working with youth, I feel like, since I've been a youth, um, <laughs> which has, I mean, tremendously informed my practice. Um, I was able to work with Ashe Cultural Arts Center with the Kaumba Institute, um, and now I'm working as the chair of the dance department at NOCA. Um, and so I have a lot of young dancers, artists coming my way, and then specifically young black dancers and artists who I am able to mentor and nurture and then able to create, again, that space with KM Dance Project for them to further their own artistic investigations. Um, as a performing artist, I have been blessed, so blessed to be able to work with some of the most amazing people right here in our city and then beyond. Um, and. I am standing on the shoulders of every single one of them. It is because 
of them that I am here right now. And so in, in my practice, it is, it is important for me to um, you know, acknowledge that and then also to be that for the young ones that I'm also, you know, have having my hands in their future and in their upbringing as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so jumping right in, um, in your opinion, is there a collective impact of African American women in the arts in New Orleans? If so, what is it? Jumping right in, we're gonna get in there. Um, can I take it, oh, can I add on to that or is it too much? Okay, so, and because this panel specifically consists of black women artistic leaders, what do most people not understand about the relationship between black artistic leadership in general and the city of New Orleans? And why does black woman artistic leadership matter? That's a lot. <laughs> I'm going to just call that too. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the collective impact. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say um, without hesitation um, that the art of New Orleans, period, is because of black women. And I'm talking mm -hmm. about ancestrally, mm -hmm. right? When we talk about what we know as the art of New Orleans, when we talk about the music, the dance, the food, all of that is made possible by black women. All of our cultural traditions, hello. You know, those kings might get up on, um, and chiefs might get up on carnival morning looking pretty, pretty, but I want you to know exactly who made them that pretty, okay? <laughs> Without hesitation, um, I mean, we, we don't even have to talk about the food, right? We don't even have to talk about the recipes right. and the art of that. Right. Um, and that is what makes New Orleans world renowned. We don't have to talk about, you know, musicians and the women who historically um, created and ran the spaces where the music could innovate, right? Mm -hmm. The marketplaces, the bar rooms, the taverns, all of those were, um, and in fact, you have a great professor here at Tulane um, who has talked about the impact of, the, of black women um, business owners and the creation of what we know of as New Orleans art. Um, and, you know, we, we, we are, it, it comes from our womb, it comes from our heart, it comes from our, um, our creativity and imagination. And so all of those things should be honored in that way. And I'm going to leave it at the ancestral realm and, you know, pass it on for y'all to talk mm -hmm. about where we are now. Hey, baby. <laughs> So I'm, I'm gonna go into the weeds a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, and there probably are other names, but I'm gonna go from the names of the folks that I know or the folks that, um, that are, have been around since I've been here. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to mention this when it comes to dance because Long before there were like real dance programs inside of schools, there were oftentimes just women mm -hmm. inside schools yeah. who had an appreciation for dance. Yeah. Velma Benjamin was one of those women. Jolene Jeff was another one of those women. Um, Kelly Petit. Kelly, Pet Kelly, um, Kelly Petit, Petit uh -huh. yeah. Kelly School of Dance. Kelly School of dance. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's some other names that we're leaving out. And then there are, there's the Greer Goff Mindy's. There is Asatua Moramin Kuhn, there's Mariama Curry, Lula Elsey, who's that? Badi Renwa, Aine, um, in theater, there's Tommy Myrick, mm -hmm. there's Adela Gauthier. I'm thinking about women who are around. I'm, I, I call them the OGs. Yes. They don't know that I call them that, but I call them the OGs. Um, Carol Sutton. Um, Gwendolyn Foxworth, mm -hmm. Gwendolyn Foxworth, um, there's uh, Choi Beche. Mm -hmm. um, so th these are women who were around um, when I was around. So I'm, oftentimes I was, I was young and very loud and disruptive and inside of the space. They were very kind. They extended grace to me. They taught me. I learned so much from these women, both 
in practical terms, but also in how they walked in the world. Also the hardship. Yes. I probably learned more from the hardship. I learned more from the hardship and I think that that's probably what fuels me now in being really the advocate shifting that narrative that I talked about, creating systemic change. When I think about what drives it, for me is around how do we create systemic change, both locally and nationally, because there is a national narrative that good art doesn't come from the South. Mm -hmm. And so the disparity, and there are multiple disparities. I'm not gonna go into that. You asked me about who. <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking about that. We'll get into that later. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I don't mind speaking on the disparities, um, uh, uh, just a little bit. Um, and, and that's because I, I think I'm, I'm riding on the tail coats of, um, of a conversation that I was a part of earlier this week, uh, which was Resistance Served a Radical Exchange Symposium. And I had the pleasure of moderating a panel on black women and labor. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of very broad, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, we led with this idea that like black women make 62, um, you know, cents on every dollar as compared to white men, cents. and 47, cents, right? Mm -hmm. And that the numbers exactly are different in the South. Mm -hmm. um, and so, when you ask about sort of impact and what don't people see, or or what are the kind of what's the kind of mm -hmm. invisible work? I mean, I think about um, the fact that. Blackness is trendy and trending, mm. and that uh, proximity to blackness, right, um, has a value, a specific financial value, mm -hmm. um, right? And so uh, by simply associating yourself with what is trendy, you have the potential to get access to resources. Um, and oftentimes what I have seen, um, in particular, I'll say in the visual arts world or interdisciplinary world that I work in, is that um, those resources do not always trickle down to the people who are actually creating the work, stewarding the work, right, and uplifting others mm -hmm. um, in that work. So um, for me, you know, I'll, I'll piggyback and just say, I think, yeah, the impact is, is um, so vast that I don't think that one panel can even get into mm -hmm. the impact of black women mm -hmm. on the arts in New Orleans. Um, but I'll kind of just end by saying, um, there is a real navigation and strategy, and you and I talked about this, and mm -hmm. I feel each of us have talked about this to some degree, um, that black women have to utilize in their day to day, moment to moment work. For instance, I'd like to point out the fact that this is being videotaped. Hopefully, it's to the benefit of others, right? But let's be clear that it changes the conversation that we might be able to have based on who might have access to this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I brought that up, that I might have to think and filter differently based on the fact that my words will be recorded and perhaps used in some other forum, right? And we see this today, for those of you who have kind of um, gotten a sense of the Gail King mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, yeah, I feel like this, this impact, this work, I hope that we go into it a, li a little bit more, but the emotional labor of caring, right? This idea that if I don't provide a resource, if I don't respond to an email, if I don't include, think about, go forwards and backwards, that the thing doesn't happen because no one else is really thinking about it in this way, potentially in my organization, right? Or in my field, mm -hmm. is a tremendous weight and burden to care that other people do not have, right? And on the flip side, I feel like the scrutiny under which mm -hmm. black women um, work is, I said today, at best, exhausting. At best. At its worst, it is dehumanizing. Yeah. It is extractive in nature, um, and it seeks to destroy the very thing that people want proximity to. Right. So, 
Yeah, I'll just, I'll leave it there. That that's my thoughts about. Yeah, and I mean, I just, I just think about my own upbringing. Like, every one of my impactful experiences has been shaped by a black woman. You know, the, through, whether it's been just my life, learning, art, dance, singing, whatever, it has always been shaped by a black woman. So black women have been holding our communities for so long and have not, have, I mean, have not necessarily been, um, you know, they have not been visible in doing that as far as, you know, on the national perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people love to come to New Orleans and, you know, and, and feed on our culture and feed on what we have and feed on our love and our sense of community, but not necessarily shedding light on what is really here and who's holding it up, who's, who's holding this up for us, who's holding this up for the youth, who's taking care of the little ones that's gonna be doing it in the next generation. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I just, yeah, just, just thinking about like the impact, mm -hmm. like every single one of us, you know, is an example of the impact um, of African, African American yeah. women holding mm -hmm. this community and organizations. Yeah, so I think I was, um, I was at a conference with, um, where Sarah Bellamy was speaking, who is the daughter of, um, oh Lord, my name's slipping. Penumbra Theater. Nobody? Okay. Um, okay, her, but anyway, she's the, she's the artistic director of uh, Penumbra Theater. And she was talking about that cultivation and development of art, the next generation of artists and how that work in her community is subsidized by black women mm -hmm. and then capitalized yes. on oh, yes. by those individuals who want to be, who have that proximity right. um, or want to be in ownership over that trend. Right. Um, and so I think a lot about the ways, I think about my mother, I think about all of the women in, in my life, uh, church mothers who, you know, yeah. would do the, you know, I'm a theater maker, so who would run, who would choose volunteer to do That's the right. Easter play project, you know, That's and right. teach us how to project right. and how to, you know, best tips from memorizing our verses, That's you know, right. and right. all of that cultivation work that is um, unrecognized, exactly. unpaid exactly. labor, exactly. and how exhausting mm -hmm. that is. I mean, you're talking about generational exhaustion. Yes. Um, and so it, le it leads me to think about, spe like specifically in this group, as I was made aware of who was gonna be on this panel, the sustainability stories. Mm -hmm. And not sustainability, a lot of people talk about sustainability from a standpoint of like organizational or institutional, like financial or even climate or environmental, but your personal mm -hmm. sustainability. So. If we can just move to how have you been able to personally and professionally sustain? If you could describe your navigation, either institutionally or artistically, and how it has affected you as a leader. Great question. Thank you, Swati. <laughs> I mean, I will speak to that. <laughs> um, because personally, I have you know, going through some very difficult health situations. And it is extremely important for you to make time and practice self-care yeah. on a daily, several times a day basis. You know, we make time and space for everybody and everything but ourselves. Mm -hmm. So putting us first is key. Second, community. Mm -hmm. Stephanie has always been, you know, one of the ringleaders and we gonna have a girl's date. You know, we gonna do a brunch. <laughs> we're gonna do our nails. We're gonna go and, you know, have some, you know, breakfast. Breakfast at La Richelieu. And, you know, we're just gonna sit by the pool. And, you know, these moments, and, and 
and, and, have, and being able to you know, have this circle of people that you can have conversations with, real, honest, releasing all of what you have been holding you know, in these spaces where you can't necessarily, you have to censor yourself. You can't be, you know, your fullest possible self. So, you know, ha having that sense of community um, and, 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 and just being honest with yourself and practicing the self-care is, yeah. is key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> probably one of the most destructive times that I can remember was um, some work that I did in New Orleans post Katrina. Mm. Um, and I was dealing with some artists that were there. Um, it was probably one of the hardest times because I was one, excited about the idea and was ready to pitch in to help rebuild the city. And then I also, I think naively, um, saw myself in this position that we're all gonna like get together and pull together and really make this happen. And wasn't really thinking about all the, the internal destruction that was there that I would have to like work against within people. So it became one of those things that, um, you know, I had, again, some really serious health challenges yeah. that were life-changing yeah. for me, yeah. life-changing. And I said I would never do that again. Mm -hmm. I would never get in that position, it literally, made me physically ill and I had to have surgery and it was terrible. It was, it was a horrible experience. Um, and I sit down and I think about the position that I'm in now and I draw boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it's important for me to draw those boundaries, um, especially if I feel like it's something, if it's something that's not really furthering how we are as a collective or really moving us forward, not just individually, but collectively moving us forward. If it's not about that, I can't really do it. I can't really do it. I, I just find myself at an age right now that it is about how are we going to get there? Has this served us? Because if it's an old model and it hasn't served us and we haven't gone anywhere and look around, we got a lot to fight against. Yeah. We haven't even gone into the numbers of what the funding picture looks like in Louisiana as a state compared to other states. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten into that. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten into what that does. Like it's not crabs in a barrel, it's more like crabs in a cup, yeah. right? Come on. Come on. We haven't gotten into that, right? <laughs> that there's really the little bit that we have here yeah. mm -hmm. is in sometimes and let me, let me just say this, it's been, I, I can, it's a, we can say that we don't, we are not gonna apply for this particular grant. We can say that now only because we have support, mainly outside of the city. And that's a choice by Junebug to do that, to leave that money there for other people because we're in a better position so we're gonna leave this money for folks that really are, are kind of struggling and that need, really need the money. Now that's a, now I can't say we always gonna be there. <laughs> One day we may need to apply for that money and we have in, uh, in times because as, as you know, things ebb and flow. Um, but the, the, the what it does to you as an individual can be, I think the hardest, I think some of the saddest times is a, there's a sense of loneliness. Um, there's a very special club, mm -hmm. very special club, because the amount of pressure that's on you of people eat or they don't. The people that you're responsible for, not just the folks that are there in that office, but this means that if I, if I fail at that, then these folks are not able to make their livelihood it's not just about what livelihood I have, but about the, I think that's the thing that weighs on me like the most. Um, and if we sat down and we thought about what the funding picture looks like and all of the work that comes, if I thought about that every day, I would never get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So you know there has to be something else deeper that draws you, that compels you to move forward with that work, mm -hmm. right? But I think that, that the amount of pressure the responsibility for a number of people that feed families, right? 
that are there, that that is a tremendous weight. Add to that what my community looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Add to that the fact that culture is being stripped out of communities and neighborhoods in ways that we've never seen before. To go into neighborhoods that I grew up in and to see it look completely different and to know that we were already ahead of the model of understanding that this is, this is what makes a thriving, mm -hmm. healthy community. Mm -hmm. They will repackage it and resell it to you as saying the developers will and saying that no, this is what a healthy neighborhood is. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have art and green space. Mm -hmm. But didn't we have that? Right. <laughs> so, you know, and lots of times what, what community looks like and what you look like sometimes mm -hmm. match up. We're struggling every day. Don't get it twisted. Executive artistic director in, name, in front of the name or not, it's a struggle every day. Mm -hmm. um, I said that was I said that was a good question, and and for anybody who sees my Facebook page, I was like, there's gonna be some soothsaying on this panel today. <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, I haven't mentioned the, all of the myriad of elders and ancestors whose work, <laughs> who, who did work in order for me to be able to sit um, in the positions that I have been fortunate enough to sit in, but I will say that um, ancestral work um, has become really just essential, like air. Mm -hmm. um, I call on my grandmother's name several times a day because she pioneered as a nurse at charity and as a healer, um, and I had the pleasure of talking to her extensively about her work uh, before she transitioned. Um, therapy, being unapologetic about the need for therapy. Um, and so I'm going to be really real saying, I actually need to speak to someone every week, forget every month. Right. Um, and that was a recent decision. Um, similarly, this idea that these transitions that I've made around boundary setting, and being clear about what I can and cannot do and what I will or will not be responsible for um, has come because of attacks at my person, my, my spiritual body, my emotional body, my physical body, right? And so very similarly, I found myself um, sick mm -hmm. with unexplainable illnesses, right? And in the midst of of, of, that, of having that experience, I talked to six or seven other black women from around the world who were in positions of power, mm -hmm. who were experiencing illnesses mm -hmm. that doctors could not explain, right? Um, women who were passing out, mm -hmm. having trouble sleeping, mm -hmm. having hysterectomies, having, you know, womb trauma, because they were caring for others more than they were caring for themselves, right? Um, and of course, these women show up to work with a smile, offer a kind word, write a letter of recommendation, make time for that conversation that you didn't plan on having, that takes longer than you expected, and now you're scrambling to do all the other things that you have to do in your day, right? Extending time, the most valuable, the most precious thing that we have access to. And so my current um, sort of strategy of navigating changes, both in and out of institutions, um, and fighting for space to be the creative that I am at my core, that makes me good at my job, right, um, is to do just that, to mm -hmm. fight for me. Mm -hmm. To fight for me to be whole and to show up mm -hmm. holistically. Mm -hmm. uh, to speak 
the words and the names of my ancestors and my elders and to call them and to thank them and as I've heard some, some of the sisters say, to, to give them their roses while they're still here. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. say their names really quickly. You know, Thelma Golden, who is the executive director of the Studio Museum of Harlem, um, has extended to me in ways that were exceptional and helped me through crisis moments by asking me good questions and giving me space and time to think about those questions, right? Didn't expect an immediate response um, and said, I'll check back in with you on that. Um, people like Rosie Gordon Wallace, um, people like Lowry Sims, people like our mama Carol who never refused uh, a conversation with me. People like Ola Ila Daste who sat with me while I diapered my baby and had conversations with me about her strategies. Mama Nana Anua who with her beautiful voice, right, led me through meditation or offered me a hug or allowed me to cry in my car and to my peers here who have allowed me to talk ad nauseum, <laughs> right, confidentially about the things that I really wanted to, to quit on, right? And say, I don't wanna do this anymore, I can't do this, right? Um, and, and gave strategies and gave resources. Um, and so I say like, that's been my way of navigating. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a work in progress, mm -hmm. um, as, as is the work. And to kind of speak a little bit to the institution that I'm currently stewarding, the New Orleans African American Museum was closed for six years. So it has history and yet it is brand new. Every system is being created every day from building servers to chart of accounts to all of the non-sexy work that is very difficult <laughs> to get up and explain to anyone about what you got accomplished in a day, right? Um, and so it requires a lot of fortitude to ground yourself in foundation building and to understand that oftentimes that work is completely overlooked. Uh, we talk about transitioning institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I am trying to do as well is to show up and to be more honest and truthful about what that work looks like to sort of peel back the onion and, and f not feel the need to simply represent, mm -hmm. but to say, this is a, li a living, breathing thing that represents community and people and land and space and memory, and that it is nonlinear. And for me to be okay with the fact that it's nonlinear, right? Mm -hmm. So where people think I should be is their opinion, and sometimes that's none of my business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right? So that's been one of my strategies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for me, I sustain myself by going to the second line. <laughs> I sustain myself at Indian practice, at the poetry readings, at the ballrooms. You catch me at Kermit's, at the candlelight, Ooh. you know. And we used to have many more. I used to be at the Caldonia, Joe's Cozy Corner, you know, any number of those places is where I sustain myself, um, you know, spiritually, um, even physically, because that's where I exercise, Lord. Um, <laughs> and most importantly, I sustain myself at those places because I know I carry the intention of busting this system wide open mm -hmm. in regards to those things. We live in a city um, that in the last couple of years, our tourist industry has grown from $7 billion to $9 billion. And they love to tout those numbers. However, the people who create that mm, industry, right. the people who put their everything into it, and that's part of like, you know, the whole thing about children. Sometimes as you're making new artists, as black women, you have to really think about, you know, what you encourage them to do because mm -hmm. all we send in our children off to the slaughter. You know, Mama Carol is fond of saying, you know, New Orleans is a city that starves the goose that lays the golden egg. Mm -hmm. And I don't intend for my children to starve, not another second. Mm -hmm. And we, our culture bearers make $17,500 a year. $17,500 a year. Mo most of them have two jobs or three jobs or whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. They don't have benefits. They get, work in this gig economy that is just, I mean, living it up. Mm -hmm. Living it up off, 
whatever saying you want to come up with, fat on the hog, whatever. And I am sustained by knowing I'm going to stop it. I'm stomping on it. I'm busting it wide open. I'm calling it out. I'm calling everybody out who participates in it. Mm -hmm. And we're not taking it for not another second. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to a question before, before we open up to questions from the audience. That leads me to this. What do you all need right now? Annotated, annotated version. I think one of the um, most dangerous things is when we cease to have space to dream and to be able to lay out a vision. I think that is one of the most dangerous things. Um, and oftentimes getting um, involved in what this rat race is takes us out of dream space. And in lots of ways, it also indoctrinates us into a space of uh, being the naysayer. Oh, that'll never happen, or this can't happen. You know, I have to watch myself sometimes. I have to really watch myself. It is, it, you have to exercise that muscle to understand when somebody that's young <laughs> or younger than you comes up and has this idea of being able to give it enough space um, to grow. Somebody did that for me one time. They could see that I, th I could see that they wanted an answer right then, but they could see that I needed more time to figure it out and that I was so close, mm -hmm. you know. Somebody did that to me, um, did that for me, and it really stuck with me afterwards. And so, and, and I think that as artists, I see that in artists sometimes, um, but I also see that in, in the people that work in my office, um, that they're so close to something, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna back off right now. You know, I know how I am, and I might want the thing right then, but I'm gonna back off for a little bit to give them that space. The importance of being able to have blue sky, particularly for black artists, because really oftentimes we're just trying to, we're trying to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to get to another day. We're trying to survive. And so it can become very difficult to be inside of a dream space. That is a space that is uh, given to those who have more power, more access, um, than we do, mm -hmm. typically. And so I would say dream space is one of those spaces. And the other thing is if we were in Fortune 500 companies, the same work that we do would be valued in a different way. A completely different way. This idea of testing out an idea, I'm not sure if it's gonna work. I think that this is gonna work, but I'm not sure. We always, we call it the, um, the swag analysis. <laughs> that you come in, you write the grant, and you have the swag analysis. Anybody familiar with that term, swag? Swag is sophisticated, wild ass guess. We don't know if it can happen. We're taking a chance. It's our best, you know, it's our best thought about if that can actually happen. Um, and so a lot of us are operating inside of that space of just trying to figure it out, but they don't oftentimes give us the money or the capital to be able to find that next place of innovation, right? We already are innovators. Think about if somebody actually capitalized our innovation, right? If we actually had the resources for that innovation, and it's gonna happen anyway, because nobody can ever keep us down. It's going to happen. It may take a little bit longer, but it's going to happen, right, inside of that space. So that the, the space for blue sky cultivates the space for innovation. And that is the thing that we have to be thinking about particularly when I'm looking at these young faces that are over here, which they waved to me when, when they came in. I'm looking at these beautiful young faces over here and I'm thinking about what is the work that we lay down that is impactful enough, that's several generations out. That means I'm not even here. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not even here, but I want to make sure that what I do right now today is impactful enough that it, it goes that far out, it ripples that far out. Um, kind of along the same lines, um, you know, we do, we write these grants and, you know, once you get it, then it's like, oh, now I got to produce all this work. I got to, and then the expectation is there that, oh, it better be good, right? Because, you know, you black, you, you the black one, we can't you getting up. it, can't and up. you representing for everybody else. So, you know, you can't mess up because if you mess up, then we ain't nobody else going to get it after you. <laughs> so, you know, it's the, the support extending grace. Mm. Yeah. I, I can't, extending grace. <laughs> you know, and not holding black women to higher expectations or higher, you know, exactly than, than everybody else. We are human beings and we are doing this just with that swag analysis. You know, we are, we are doing our best and we are working from the heart. So if you can trust and believe and go along for the ride and have faith in us, we need the support. We need the support. We, we ain't let you down yet, right? We, we always come through. It might not be pretty sometimes, but it's going to happen. It's going to always come through. We're going to make it to the other end. And again, the financial support, I, I, you know, if, if I had somebody to just be like, girl, look, here, here go a warehouse. I'm going to turn this into a big stage and studio space for you and dance, you know, classes and and we're going to give you the money to pay for your staff, and you don't have to worry about your students going to have scholarships come. I mean, you know, this is happening to some people. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. I don't know them people. You know, I don't know people that get it to me, but <laughs> if you know somebody that might, hey, you know, send them my way. But, but it does happen. Now, like, I hear about it, and I see, like, dang, you know, how? But... You know, but, but what about collective resources? What about if we were doing for, you know, investing in our community? So I think there's something about, yes, collective investment. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see people doing work, send something their way. Whether it's, you know, financial, send resources their way to help them and support them inside that work. Mm. I, you know... Yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. Um, when, when black women work, we support everyone. Absolutely. Everyone benefits. Yeah. Um, because again, to your point, as the cradle of the culture, right, everyone receives something. Um, and so I have a, a kind of institutional list. You know, the New Orleans African American Museum is not the first institution to make the kind of transition that it has, but black museums and institutions have traditionally been and systemically underfunded. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we could get into the politics of what that looks like, but I encourage you to look that up and do your research yourself. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so other institutions, our counterparts, institutions are able to withstand mm. leadership changes, withstand the kind of changes that come with economies that shift funding mm -hmm. streams because those resources look very different from the inception. And so um, one of the things that I need is trust. Mm -hmm. I need trust and I need people to look at my track record, right, of what has been produced and to seed that which will come forth, right? Um, again, based and rooted in a real practice. Um, I need institutionally um, community. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, someone uh, mentioned the isolation. Oftentimes we can put our leaders in this isolated place in which community views them differently, they become the, the face of resources for. And the reality is that it is a symbiotic relationship because oftentimes community can say things we cannot. Mm -hmm. 
Oftentimes, we need community to show up in numbers in order to showcase the work and to support the work. Um, and oftentimes, community needs us to be that brave person who is willing to be the truth teller in rooms that we have access to. So um, I would say there's a, there's a quote out there that says, you know, um, call your strong friend and ask if she's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Call that strong person and check on them. Yeah. Um, and so I, 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 I ask for that. Um, if I'm a person who has extended something to you, humanize me by asking me how I'm doing and wait for the response. Yeah. Give me space for the response, right? Genuinely care about how I'm doing because how I'm doing effectively can shift how we are doing. Um, institutionally, I need capacity to be in that dream space, right? I, you said earlier, Stephanie, you know, that being a leader in a small institution, you do whatever's necessary, right? You pick up trash outside, you take out the trash, you clean the bathrooms if necessary, you clean up after people if they leave trash in your space. You paint and touch up paint. Mm. You build the server, you acquire skills that allow you to do the next thing, right, which is the larger level work. Now that's indicative of the nonprofit industrial complex, but let's be clear, the expectation of black women is that we humbly, graciously do it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanna be clear, that's exhausting, exhausting work. So we have a habit at the museum of after an event has taken place, that my team encourages others to help put away the chairs. Now that's not a huge act, but what it is is a symbolic act that we take care of this space. This is a space for us. And if you're asking me to decolonize a museum space, right? If you're asking me to put the collection and the work in conversation with the community that that work comes from, then we have to be community mm -hmm. in that space, yeah. right? Yeah. Which means we have to behave differently. So these ideas of elitism, these ideas of hierarchy have to be broken down, not mm -hmm. just in our intellectual understanding, but in our actions yes. when we are on land mm -hmm. in a space, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where blood has been shed, mm -hmm. where injustice exists, mm -hmm. right? And where ancestors are angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm about the current affairs. Mm. Personally, what I need are some of the things that I have repeatedly and constantly given to others. And, and one of them, and I'm, I'm putting it out there because it's on film and maybe somebody will see and have that resource, <laughs> right? Um, I need a residency. I've spent six years building a residency um, from the ground up. And I need time and space to reflect on that experience and that of the experience that I have now of rebuilding an institution. Uh, because that change work is very, very heavy work. Um, I need to be paid like a white man. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying that I'm saying that for any funders who'd like to, you know. <laughs> um, I need I, I and I need to be able to pay the people in my community well, right? So I don't want to simply sit at the top and right. make money right. and then penny pinch those around me right. as if abundance does not exist because it does, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I need us to move out of a space of scarcity and, and, and step into abundance, both in our thoughts and our creations and in our actions. Once again, if you're allying with me, then be in abundance with me, right? Don't expect me to be on the short end of the stick. Um, I need time. Time is the great equalizer of human beings. I need time because time has been stolen from me. Time has been stolen from my elders and ancestors. So when I say I can't get back to you right now, part of it is that I need to be gracious, I need to be thoughtful in my response, and you probably don't want the response of me being reactive in the first place. So I need time um, to collect my thoughts 
and to again be in my body and fully understand my response mm. to my community and to the people that I'm accountable to. Um, and, and finally, I would just say, we need platforms. I need platforms to show up as my whole self, mm -hmm. a creative person with a practice who is also an administrator, who is a leader with or without a title, right? Because leadership is an action, not a title. Mm -hmm. And so when we have these platforms, I always ask who is moderating, who is setting the container for the conversation? And I was so happy, Lauren, based on our conversations, that you were the person who would hold space for us. Mm -hmm. And so again, this idea of giving people their roses while they're here, mm -hmm. I just wanna thank you for making sure that we can have this kind of conversation. <laughs> and I wanna thank my panelists right now because mm -hmm. quite frankly, you all have lifted weights and held them for me at various points when I needed advice mm -hmm. or I needed to simply vent. Mm -hmm. And so I need more of that. I need to go to lunch or have breakfast or coffee and not simply sit at a computer and robotically give everybody <coughs> what they need. I need to connect with my peers and with other peers to explain what is going on, right? And I need that to be understood that that is in fact work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is labor. Mm -hmm. And that helps me to do my job better. Yeah. So I could go on and on and on, but I wanna respect. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna respect my friend and colleague to my left. Well, thank you. I, um, so again, yes and yes and yes and yes to all of that. Um, and exponentially, so amplify um, every every word that you've heard these women say. Um, you know, let it resound within you, right? Let it let it move your hands and your feet, and let it um, do something in your spirit. Yeah. I just let it let it do that mm -hmm. in your spirit. Um, and I'm going to uh, close by saying that what I need is policy. And we have some people in the room who can make some policies mm -hmm. happen. So I'm gonna look this way. Mm -hmm. I have been traveling the world talking about these things, talking about place, talking about equity, talking about community. And when I go to these places, I always seek us out, of course. Mm -hmm. And what I am finding is that the places, just like in New Orleans, we're on the tail end of the gentrification thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's already happened in so many other places and everywhere I go, I have to read a marker that tells me about the black people who used to live there. I have to read a marker that tells me what our community used to be, mm -hmm. you know, in the shadow of $3 million condos. Mm -hmm. um, in the projects, let's get it wrong, let's not get it twisted. It's still the project building. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so you could have done this when we were living there, mm -hmm. right? Um, I was just in New York reading a marker about where Sojourner Truth used to do her thing and now it's Empire State Building and Broadway and all of those things and we forget mm -hmm. um, it, that we're being relegated to the periphery. And the only thing that can protect us is policy. We cannot beat the market. When the white, wealthy, well-connected people of San Francisco found themselves faced with the uber-wealthy people of Silicon Valley who wanted their city, you know what they had to do? Move. They are now in Oakland. And Oakland is 5% black now. And where are they? Who knows? Dispersed. So if the white, wealthy, well-connected people of San Francisco could not protect themselves from the market, what are we to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so since we have the vote, and since we have elected officials and administrators who have the capacity to regulate the market, we demand that the market is regulated on our behalf, yeah. Yeah. not on behalf of the wealthy mm -hmm. and well-connected, no matter what color they are. We demand that we have the right to stay in our communities, that we still, my children could still play band by picking up 
um, rocks and sticks like I used to do because I knew what a musician was in my neighborhood and I knew what a musician's importance was in my community and I, and I knew what music sounded like from the time when people first picked up an instrument and tried to figure out how to make it work until they were you know playing for the masses at Lincoln um, Center. You know, and I know what that whole life cycle looks like because my community made it possible. Mm -hmm. It's not happening anymore. And the things that you all love about what we call home, this shared home, is being destroyed by the market. And so we need a policy and we need everyone in here, not just the people who are going to create the policy, but those who are going to champion it, those who are going to vote for it and fight for it, and no matter what it costs and what it takes to make it possible for people like us to even exist. Because when you take away the community, when you take away our proximity to one another, you take away the magic that makes it all happen. Yeah. So, I'm gonna calm down. <laughs> and I'm gonna lean back. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna say that we need all of these things and we need them simultaneously. We need them in abundance and we need you and you and you and you and you to join us in that work. So, okay, okay, so yeah, we're gonna um, we're gonna open it up for questions from you all, comments that you may have. Um, and uh, like Asali was saying, taking a few moments to kind of ruminate on what was just put into the room as far as needs and perhaps, Maybe it is within your power or you're connected to network um, that can supply a need and think about that and how you can connect with um, our panelists and the larger need. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I, when you guys were talking about grants, it got me thinking a lot about times where I've worked in various nonprofit arts organizations. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question about how do you feel the whole kind of chasing the money thing that is required affects the work that you're, the creative work that you're able to mm. produce? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I'm actually starting to settle into being all right with chasing the money right now. That's something I didn't think that I would get comfortable with, but it's something I've gotten actually developed a little bit of a skill set with. And so I see myself as someone to do that. Now where we need to shift though with the chasing the money is really in how the money is supposed to be dispersed. There are all these rules with how that money is supposed to be dispersed. One of the things that we did this year to really shift what that model looks like is to say, look, you need to give us money because we want to give these artists money in New Orleans, period. And no, we don't want them to have to go through a whole lot to do it. We want them, we're giving them the money so they can do their work, mm -hmm. period. That is a huge shift. Yeah. That's a huge shift in how money generally comes to organizations and what we're supposed to use it for. I will say one of the things that, um, Junebug hasn't always been good at that, um, is because we are a nonprofit, like other nonprofits, we've struggled, right? And so the percentage of money that actually went out to artists wasn't what we wanted that to be. I'm really happy to say that that percentage is huge now in the number, the amount of money that we, we're gonna spend almost $200,000 that goes direct support to artists in this year mm -hmm. out of our budget. <laughs> And we're an organization of only uh, four people mm -hmm. in, the, in, in there. So that's a huge chunk of that money. But I think that shifting that in that way opened me up, actually. It opened me up in a way that I'm like, oh, no, this is what I should be doing in this way mm -hmm. um, is, 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 is kind of shifting it in that way. And so it's not as much of a burden for me. But that's not the same for everybody else. It's not lost on me that we're in a chapel. Mm -hmm. And I feel like how you feel when you came from real church. <laughs> the resolution, the guidance, 
about cried about four times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel very connected to my sheroes on the stage, women that I deeply admire and love. Hold on. <laughs> it's a safe space. It's a safe space for it all. <laughs> so um, I want to I want to ask you guys a question, and it is in the blue space that space of imagination. I had an opportunity to co-captain a Mardi Gras crew for the first time, Women of Wakanda. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm only saying that to say what is Wakanda, what did it mean to us when we saw that film and we saw a complete, not a decolonized space, but an uncolonized space, a space of excellence, a space of pure abundance, and how we would see and perceive our future um, uninhabit uninhibited. What I also hear on this stage is a schizophrenia to some extent of being consistently in white spaces and white institutions having to live by those um, constraints and rules and then also trying to create new realities for us. I lived that reality as assistant professor, as a consultant for the city, building equity, but building equity within the constructs of restraint and mm -hmm. underfundedness. So my question to you brilliant, brilliant women, is what part of your work has been fully created by you that had nothing to do with an inhibited and restricted place that you would hold up and perpetuate on into the future. Mm -hmm. Your your That's little great. piece of Wakanda. That's great. You're gonna have to moderate the next one. So I'm going to ask you, only because we're being recorded, if you are speaking, can you speak into the mic so that he can oh, pick you up? Oh, and for people uh, in the crowd uh, here. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I'd like to, when I mentioned before, I like to say that there's a little piece of Wakanda that was always there. You know, in lots of ways, I felt like Black Panther kind of took a little bit of our shine away that we already had. And I'm like, oh, Black Panther's doing it now. But long before Black Panther, <laughs> long before Black Panther, we were sitting and thinking about how do we turn around and show our dopeness? How do we show our flyness? How do we show our brilliance? How do we show that joy? How do we also remember so in lots of ways, I feel like what, what my Wakanda is in creating this 21st century Sankofa model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question back here. Hi, it's not so much a question as a thank you. I'm a brown woman, Mexican immigrant, and I just learned so much this morning from all of you. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And mom. I know we're being recorded, but I don't, <laughs> I don't plan on filtering what I have to say. <laughs> um, working for city government for the first time, I showed up as myself, wholly, every day, and I was labeled as the angry black woman in the room. But actually, I was the brave truth teller in the room. I still am. So I'm gonna ask that when you see me, and yes, those five minutes of unwarranted meetings and phone calls and the misguided anger that I've experienced, I'm in the room intentionally. I, I grew up in New Orleans. 
from a, a lineage of Aretha Castle Haley and many others. Um, I'm not a pushover. I ain't changed because I'm working for the city. <laughs> you know, I was always taught to think I'm all that, and I do. Um, <laughs> but what I'm saying is I want policy too. But there is a learning curve, but I brought my whole radical self in that room. That's right. And I'm at tables where I didn't want to, to go and sit at. And my mayor told me, you're going to go and sit at those tables. So sometimes what you see on the outside is not what's happening on the inside. But I am a black woman. And sometimes we do need that lunch and that yeah. coffee and just that hug. But yeah, I kicked some doors in. And I'm still willing to do that again. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Denise Frazier for yes. concept well thank you. for doing this. And and there's so much. There's so much. Just I'm so happy that I'm I'm here. Um, and I want to thank Gia because Gia, you were one of the first people who reached out to me to help me visualize what I was doing and support me, and that's really important. Um, but the thing that keeps coming up for me is the, the gap in leadership. All of us got where we are, for, not in a straight line, obviously. We went different points, gathered information, gathered support, gathered mentorship. And the thing that I want to see is something that is a little bit more formal perhaps or something that we can do together in New Orleans as a mentorship training program mm -hmm. for, for black women. So, you know, I have the capacity to do that and I think that's really important because we see the breakdown of the community, the breakdown of all those access points to meet those people that could help you. Um, that's what I'm seeing for younger people is that they don't have access to the people to invigorate um, and help them along the way. Um, one of the other things that is important to me in New Orleans is that it's not about output and it's about what you give to people along the way. And in the history of the women and men that helped to create New Orleans as it is now, there were a lot of unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about that. And then finally, um, I'm here with a friend from Chicago, brought some Chicago people here to New Orleans, and I know this is really good for her. And along the way, we were talking about a new residency here in New Orleans. And I'm like, you know what? After what you guys have said, no, a residency for women who are working in the arts, black women working in the arts. Not necessarily arts, the artists, but working in that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. In the interest of everyone's time, we have time for three more. Okay. <laughs> Ladies, who I admire, community, who I'm entrusted to serve, I want to just answer to that on policy. I've traveled to San Francisco. Artists are being moved out because they are canceling the leases. We are not going to allow that to happen. I want you to know, Mayor Cantrell was already ahead of it. I've just done one year in this position, and so I had to ride along and take that journey to understand what's happening right now. I now see it, I now get it. This is what's going to happen this year in 2020. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be the opportunity. We're moving towards a cultural commission that is gonna be formed. You will be seated at the table. You will be seated at the table so that we can create policy that is representative, reflective, and is real. Yes. <laughs> As far as artists and opportunities, right, the opportunities are not getting there. It's repackaged and sold because there's someone in the middle. So not wanting to be a disruptor, I just want to create opportunity. So in order to create opportunity, we have to provide a platform for our artists to be contacted, reached directly through websites, through a link by which a person who wants to hire you, wants to purchase your work, wants to engage you, wants to experience what you have from art, from culinary, all forms of art, we need to, as a city, create that cultural platform. That's in the works. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, I see that so much has existed 
in its own space. When there's so much talent and so much opportunity, we don't need to recreate it. It is already created in here. We need to connect it. So we are dropping down the walls of tourism agencies, other institutions, other groups, foundations. There are foundations who have the money. I just learned there are some foundations that only spends a dollar and 29 cents on art because they're really having a challenge in trying to figure out how to connect. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to make the connection. Mm -hmm. However, not saying it's here or there, what I'm saying is, okay, we're standing here, we're ready to create that opportunity to connect. Mm -hmm. So direct connection, engagement, and information of where the resources exist. Those are the three things that I assure you I am working tirelessly to make happen this year and you all may connect with me at some point in time. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Lexi Frame. Um, uh, I'm a member of Lake Rio Viole, which is an organization. It's a collective of black women on campus. Um, and we work on... <laughs> Um, we work on creating policy um, on campus and advocating for equity and championing like justice and liberation for all. Um, and so as I'm graduating this semester and moving off of campus, I was wondering about y'all's thoughts and your perspective and your experience um, as black women creatives in New Orleans. Um, how did you build something from the ground up and what that journey might have looked like? I know that we probably only have time for like one person to answer, but if anyone feels really passionate about that, um, then I would love to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so KM Dance Project was built from the ground up. I mean, it was literally, it started based off of desire. This is the, the desire to create, the desire to, you know, put my work out there for people to see and witness and experience and share. Um, but lots of mistakes and tumbling and scrumbling around and, you know, a lot of work. It's just a lot of, a lot of administrative work. Um, you know, I don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any resources to hire someone to write grants for me. So I have to do all that work myself. I'm doing the planning, I'm you know, organizing people for rehearsals. So it does, it takes a lot of time and commitment. And so I think it just, you know, it, it depends on what it is that you wanna do and if you feel very strongly about whatever the thing is that you wanna do and, and, and finding that community of people who know that this is something great, this is something that I wanna be a part of, knowing that you have that, I think it's just, it's all worth it. So it's just gonna take time and hard work and you know, all the things that we don't necessarily see happening, but we see, the, we see all the productions, we see the grand finale, we see all of that, we're like, oh, y'all so good, and you ain't see all that sweat, though. you ain't see all them nerves, you ain't see all that running around and trying to the last minute. Um, yeah, so it, it, time, time. And I, I think I can speak to that too. Yeah. Having started, um, I got the thing. Uh, having started, no dream deferred from nothing, and it's still we're still climbing here. So um, no dream deferred started as a conversation between my producing partner and I, India Mac, about we're two black mothers, creators, artists, and we said, what if we could create a space where we don't have to keep deferring everything about our dreams because of everything else that's going on in our lives. And we could create that same energy for okay. all the other artists, mothers, Please. folks who have bills, who have ailing parents, who have other things going on, black and brown artists as well. So um, that's how it started. Um, and it's been this constant exploration of that question of how do we create the space? How do we maintain it? Um, and then also what fueled us in a lot of ways was anger, anger around the fact that those, that opportunity, that dream space is readily available for um, so many other people, but we're denied that same dream space. Now, now the question for us has become how do we sustain? Yeah. Um, because the anger and the passion and the question and the exploration is really great energy to start. 
but how do you sustain? And we're learning more and more, like Gia mentioned, that it's really about us almost in a way backing, taking a step back and saying what we're creating, how wanted and needed is it by community, and then how willing is community to, um, how willing are they to support it? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's it. And then resource-wise, partnering. I was just about to say Partnering, that. partnering, to say. partnering yeah. um, is mm -hmm. key. Um, and uh, so aligning yourself with people who are like-minded yes. yes. and have, or have similar missions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Find those allies, people who are, who are going to advocate for you. Mm -hmm. And come hang out at Ashe. It's a very um, <laughs> wonderfully nurturing, nurturing yes. space. <laughs> Just a quick question about the journalism media piece in your ecosystem. How, hey. how sad, <laughs> hi. How satisfied are you? What structures need to be put in place? Do you have good advocates in the current landscape? What do you need on that front? Can we just say bye to the ladies? Bye. Bye, ladies. Thank you for being here. And did you want to did you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Okay, no, she's a journalist, so just so you know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I think it's going to be different. I think it's different for for different yes. organizations in terms of like what the needs are. I can say um, Junebug um, is forty years old this year, and Junebug I think has a larger. <laughs> thank you. Junebug probably has a larger national profile than it has as a local no, uh, profile. Mm. And that saddens mm. me. That saddens me. We go into, I go into these spaces in other places, other cities, um, and they know Junebug. They know of the work. Uh, they know of the struggle. They know the history of it. It saddens me that so few people here in New Orleans know the history of Junebug. And I don't know what that is. I know that we're committed to trying to change that narrative this year. We looked at the fact that it was the 40 year anniversary and thought this is a good time to remind people of, of what Junebug is. I mean, we don't just do this work. When we're out in the world, we act as advocates for this city. We are, um, acting as ambassadors, cultural ambassadors for this city. We're not named as such. We don't need to be named as such, but we do need to be recognized that that is work that is happening, that names are being dropped, um, folks are being lifted up in this city in a way, and this is how you know that they are. When you see that the Ford Foundation is coming here and making New Orleans one of the spaces that they're turning around and that they're focusing on, that is not just driven by the city of New Orleans, that is driven by the folks that are acting as advocates for this city um, and cultural ambassadors for this city as well, that those things come together to create the perfect storm. Um, I would say that locally we need more more work with like getting that narrative out and more support, I think, from the city in that way. Um, and then nationally also keep being, making sure that the story that's being told is your story. Mm -hmm. And not a story that is written about by someone else and co-opted in a different spin. And I'm saying that this is really important, getting back to the media piece that it's very important for us to really tell the true story, for us to tell our own stories, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to them being written about by other folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and our... Can I... Um, yes, ma'am, of course. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, so thank you for that question. I think it's something that, um, I mean, I feel like we get some support. I mean, I, you know, I think um, Doug McCash is, you know, great. Um, uh, what is my friend's name at the advocate? Um, mm, um, Katie. Katie? Oh, yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm blanking on her name. She's my neighbor. Anyway, wonderful person, wonderful um, art, artist. Yeah, Katie. Um, and but I think we need much more. And I and so I want to turn the question back to you. What does journalism need um, from us? Because I know. So I just know as a as an art form, journalism is suffering, you know, terribly. And so I'm looking at ways that Ashe can be supportive, you know, inside of that space um, too. Mm -hmm. And how can we help to um, support and create more journalists of color and more women journalists um, and journalists with the freedom mm -hmm. to do the kind of work that you know. Um, amplifies all of us. Um, so I would, you know, l like to talk more about that. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I want to shout out like Eric Bookhard, who recently passed away, who was the very first person who wrote about my work when I came back to the city in 2008 that was doing work in Central City in a little shotgun yes. double, right? And because he wrote about that exhibition, that space became a space that other people felt comfortable coming to in Central City in 2008 when it was not a cool neighborhood to hang out in. Um, and that was from a kind of um, an openness from him to, to extend a friendship and to get to know me and my practice. Um, you know, I, I would say personally, I have never had, a, had trouble getting press as a, as a leader of an institution. I think, you know, at the New Orleans African American Museum, because of the past trouble, it's very easy to write about what's wrong or to speculate without facts. Um, or context for what it means. Um, and so I, I urge the, the journalism community to really get to know what is really happening um, and to promote the work that is happening. We had three exhibitions last year and those exhibitions didn't get coverage, right? Welcome to the Afrofuture Ground Zero, little plug here, uh, was a survey of 33 artists 20 of whom were black and from New Orleans, um, visual artists specifically. And, and, and so, you know, when we can cover Noma and the Ogden, who are great partners and colleagues of mine, why can't we cover this show that explores black spaces, black geographies, and black bodies in the future, right? That seems newsworthy to me, mm -hmm. given some of the other issues that we have in this city. Um, so I would say, you know, I'm grateful for the press. We had 28 pieces of press last year for the New Orleans African American Museum. But similar to what uh, Stephanie is saying, most of it mm -hmm. was national press. Mm -hmm. And most of it, right, were people who were interested in my leadership. My goal as the executive director at the New Orleans African American Museum is to set up structure and vision for the next leader. Mm -hmm. That's important. The next people who work there should have something strong to build mm -hmm. on, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not interested just in it being about my voice. I'm interested in interview the artists that we had in this show. Talk to them about their practice. How did they get access to resources? That's what's most important um, to me. So to answer your question, I think it's yes and. Mm -hmm. And there's been one last. Yeah, well. And just wanted to add, uh, historically, uh, sorry, historically, uh, real, real quick, historically dance has had little to no press in this city. You know, there's, there's nobody, you know, writing about dance or doing any reviews. And, and, and it's just so important because people come from out of town and believe that there is no dance community here. Or, a, or who are qualified to do the review. Absolutely. So, you know, to... If, if there is any way that we can produce, you know, more people who have time to be able to come out mm -hmm. and, and look and see the work and, you know, and, and, and get to know the dance community here, I think it would be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say thank you, first of all, because these women up here are really uh, culture bearers in the city. Each and every one of you, and I'm sorry I didn't give you kisses early. It's been so long, I didn't recognize you. But you said something to me that impressed me. Uh, you did something that you have no idea, but I'm going to tell you afterwards. And I just want to say, I want to touch, I want to touch um, on the policy, yes, because the rents can't keep rising when the salaries are not. Ooh, Those things need on. to be connected so one can't rise without the other. I want to touch on the residencies, Gianna left, but residencies not just for young people, but for single parents, for people yes. over 40. Because I am, o I'm over 40 and I'm still trying to figure out how to not have a day job, Come how on. I can simply be an artist. And I have a 10 year old who is a performer and an artist. And so I'm putting all of my energy into her so that while she is super cute with her Afro puffs, she can make some money now as a kid that I will put in a trust for her so when she's in her 20s, she can explore her creative arts and yeah. not struggle in the way that I am struggling and still yet to be fully realized as an artist. Yes. So I do wanna just say thank you so much much. Stephanie, you once told me that, um, and I, I am going to say it because I think it's important for people to see community, um, I'm just always inspired by the fact that you would turn down 
an offer made by a developer because it wasn't what you needed to be, mm -hmm. right? That you are not afraid to turn down something that seems like it could be a big thing because it's not what right. you need yep. to grow. You helped me. You don't even know, but you were one of the first few people when I adopted my daughter this last um, August, four years ago, I brought her to Ashe for Kumba because I just got her. She was a neighbor down the street and I worked and I needed a place for her to be. She hadn't enrolled in the camp and you were there for us. I'm gonna show you pictures of this baby because she's thriving and she's beautiful right. and she's amazing. Right. And thank you. Absolutely. Lauren, you're doing things in the city that people are not, like, you know, you are really, uh, the poster child for, we're gonna make some shit happen. <laughs> I don't know how, but we're just gonna do it. I find you to be a daily inspiration to me. Gia, I don't know how you do what you do with five kids looking so fabulous <laughs> and constantly just right. able, right? I love you so much. Asali, every time I see you at all these places that you mentioned before, you lift my spirits and you, we have that same sort of fighting spirit and I hope that you do not lose that. I want you to stomp on all the shit that needs to go and I will help you. I love it. Um, okay, so just to close out. So um, in closing, I just have one more thing to ask of the panelists. Um, but before I ask that, I just want to thank you all again for being here, for making time to come here, taking that extended lunch, or just calling out today, whatever you did. Um, and I want to thank Denise and Dr. Proctor and Rebecca and everyone here at Tulane who can, this is the second conversation in this series. Yeah. There was one last year and we had another fabulous panel of African American women artists as well. And so continuing, staying committed to creating a space where these conversations can happen as a first step, because we all know conversation is like a first step, right? It's not the work, but it's the, there's a beginning to the work. Um, so I just want to thank you. And my last question for everyone here is, once again, twofold. What is giving you joy right now? Mm. And where and how can we experience your work, art, currently? Mm. Being in this space with this energy, these beautiful and amazing women, I am honored so full <laughs> and just to know you know the work that you do is loved and appreciated is I, I can't describe the feeling the joyfulness that I feel so thank you thank you all um, I'm sorry I get so emotional you did it to me <laughs> it's the trigger <laughs> Um, but I am currently working on a piece called Raw Fruit, um, and we will be premiering this work uh, in November, on my birthday, November 5th. Yay, birthday! <laughs> yes, November 5th, 6th, and 7th at the Contemporary Arts Center. Um, and, you know, we're so grateful. We have, you know, this national support to be able to do this. And then we have, of course, the plethora of community support. You know, Ashe Cultural Arts Center, the Contemporary Arts Center, Junebug, NOCA. We, we could not have done any of this without any of those people. So I hope you're around in November. Come check us out. And next week, she'll be directing the Vagina Monologues. Yes, and Ashe. yes. Look. All of it. We need all of it. I'm in Cam Dance Project mode. Yes, details. yes. Next week, Vagina Monologues, next Saturday and Sunday. Oh, we have an amazing group of women. Oh, they are getting it on. So Saturday and Sunday at 7 p.m. Um, I have to echo the same thing. It actually feels really good um, to not feel alone. So when I sit and I look here, actually within the last few weeks, I've already had conversations with all of the women up here. Um, about how we're gonna take over the world, okay. how we're gonna shift and change some stuff, but also how do we, what are the ways that we build not just our individual works, but our collective works? How do we build our collective works? I, 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 what gives me joy is thinking that there are people um, that are my contemporaries, that our thought process is how do we move everyone forward um, at the same time? So that is what's giving me um, tremendous joy right now. Um, and in terms of where you can see our work, um, 
uh, Junebug will be presenting, um, I'm gonna say Junebug's work. We're presenting vessels in March. Ooh. That's who we're presenting in March at the um, Peter, Hotel Peter and Paul oh, in March. Right. And for those who want to take a little trip to Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. um, coming uh, to Brooklyn is Gomila to return Movement of yes. Our Mother Tongue. <laughs> Being presented by 651 Arts and High Arts in New York, it will be outside at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. It's a very big deal. Yeah. It's a very big deal. <laughs> It's in June, it's yeah. the middle of June. So we will be there in June and we're trying to have a whole New Orleans takeover. Right. So come through New Orleans. Oh, we're just going around? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, <laughs> yes. Clue myself. Yes. Um, so what's giving me joy right now is saying no. Yeah. And taking naps. Seemingly inappropriate times. Like, I can't do that meeting because I'm going to be taking a nap. And I encourage that, I encourage you all to try it. Um, as far as where to experience um, my work and also No Dream Deferred's work, so personally, I'm going to be playing Bernice in the piano lesson, which will be at La Petite opening on March 6th. Um, this is also during the time of the August Wilson like festival that's going to be in town. So please, you know, revisit. It's a it's a it's a brilliant, brilliant play written by someone who is very much treasured and loved in the theater community. And um, and then No Dream Deferred is opening Booty Candy by Robin O'Hara in May. So it's, it's everything. It is it is a dark, absurd comedy about the complexities of growing up as a gay black boy in black families community. And we're really excited about it. And we look forward to you all visiting our website, www.nodreamdeferrednola.com, getting a ticket. If you can't get a ticket, reach out to me and we'll talk about it because I think everyone should be there. It's gonna be a big black gay party. Okay. Yeah. So that's the vision, that's the vision. <laughs> I'm going to echo that this felt good. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it doesn't feel good to sit on panels, but this felt good, so yeah. thank okay. you. Um, looking in my seven-month-old's eyes um, brings me joy uh, when he looks back with wonderment. Um, Sunday brunches with my girlfriends who just listen and laugh, and we just are in our free space, one of whom is right here. Um, and I, you know, I'll be honest, I have struggled with what my practice is and where you can find it mm -hmm. and what that means. But the end of last year and the beginning of this year really led me to start applying for opportunities to revamp a concept that I developed uh, a decade ago, um, Grigri Lab, which lived in a place um, and that place was taken because of gentrification and displacement. And um, I'm working currently with an architect and some designers to really um, make that space mobile and flexible and movable. Nice. Um, and it's, I'm in process. And I've manifested a studio space for Ooh. myself um, nice. that I'll be working on bringing Grigri Lab back to life. Oh, yeah. Wow. 4.0. Yes. Um, so, check out uh, my website, uh, GiaHamiltonStudio.com, and hopefully I will be as good about putting up when you can see that work um, as I am about the other things in my life. But thank you for asking that question. Of course. Whew, okay, so again, you know, you can't help but to say, I mean, I, I think everybody feels the joy that mm -hmm. you are sharing our joy. You are part of this joy that we are experiencing right now. So that's the joy I'm feeling right now in this exact moment, but in general, um, you know, just enjoying my kids in a new way um, has been, you know, wonderful, like as they are. Um, like even my scientist kids. So like I always say, I had a warrior, a scientist, a scholar, you know, um, and but all of them are kind of getting into art a little more. So my one that's an artist, that's all oh, he, yeah, he dances, he paints, he sings, he, 
you know, what, whatever it is, he, he's that. Um, but even my, my scientist kid, you know, is starting to get into art and my, um, my warrior kid, Lord have mercy, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's starting to write. Um, and so that, that has been, you know, really um, wonderful. And um, so you can see me actually tonight. I'll be at um, the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra um, doing some poetry in honor of Aretha Castle Haley. Um, and I have a couple of TED Talks online with some performances that you can check out as well if you just want to hear me do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yay! All right, thank you all. Thank you for being here.